What's going on everybody? Welcome to the Senior Symposium 2018. Today we have James Cooper um, and his presentation is going to be on applied machine learning, um, focus on autonomous navigation. Um, and his advisor is Anthony Teat sitting in the back. Good luck James. Welcome everybody, welcome to my capstone presentation. As you just said, my name is James Cooper. My advisor is Dr. Anthony Teat, and as you can see behind me, I decided to study applied machine learning and specifically autonomous navigation with image recognition. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is to define AI and machine learning. Uh, AI is a branch of computer science dedicated to remapping or imitating the human consciousness, specifically thought, dynamic decision making, and emotion. Uh, and as you can see, this is replication of the human neuron compared to the artificial neuron. Both of them, as you can see, have inputs, the X and the dendrites, and the axon and the activation function, these are both the message terminals, and the, the output, the uh, axon terminal, and the output right there. And machine learning is a little different because it focuses more on complex data sets and identifying patterns and trends within them uh, to help better classify the data within the data set. So these are just some examples of, again, what the differences between AI and machine learning are. AI, this one on the left is Sophia. She is a humanoid robot by Hanson Robotics. Uh, she can con conversate with humans. Uh, she recently, I believe, was on Jimmy Kimmel and also did an interview with Will Smith on his YouTube channel. It's actually pretty cool. Uh, the next one is Tay Tweets, which is a Twitter bot made by Microsoft. Uh, didn't really go very well. Within the first 24 hours, it went from wanting to conversate with people to becoming a Nazi sympathizer. <laughs> so it didn't go very well. Uh, but instead, you can see machine learning uses more of data sets. This is the IRIS data set. This is probably the most common data set in machine learning. And it creates statistical models to help define new input data based on past data. So if you were to take a sample of one of those flowers you found in the wild and you put it in this model, it would likely put it in one of these three categories and give you what it predicted would be that species. So within machine learning, there are generally about three different topics. I'm not really gonna talk about reinforcement learning because that's more an AI topic, but what I'm gonna talk about is supervised and unsupervised learning. <coughs> supervised learning is like the way we learn as children, where if we don't know what something is, we would ask our parents, what is that? They would say it's a giraffe, a car, whatever. So then the next time the computer comes up to that, they would know it's a giraffe, a car, whatever. And unsupervised learning just feeds data sets into algorithms that are very unstructured, very complex, and just helps group them into similar categories to better understand the data with it. So now that you know what machine learning is, what drives machine learning? Well, it's the data. And as you can see by this uh, report by The Economist, data is now becoming what oil used to be in the past couple decades, being the hottest commodity. And what comes with who has the hottest commodity is the most money and the most power. So as you can see, these companies like Amazon, Google, Facebook, all have all of the data. So they have that, so now they needed to figure out what are they gonna do with it. So they use machine learning to better understand all those complex data sets that they have to draw conclusions and make better services for their customers. And so what does that mean for us, the consumer? As you can see, these are some of the uh, services we all probably use every day, Spotify, Amazon, YouTube. And what they use is a process called collaborative filtering, which groups us based on with other people that have similar online behaviors as ourselves. So they take the patterns that we use and they recommend videos that people like us or videos, products, or songs that people like us probably listen to. So that lets them have services that are better suited for us specifically. And I also have Facebook up here because I just wanted to show how big of an industry this kind of data science and data machine learning is is Facebook just last year made over $40 billion in ad revenue alone just by people wanting to come in, use their data, and help uh, better understand their customers and hopefully sell products to them. And so what does that mean for us trying to create machine learning algorithms? So those data sets can be compacted into places like the UCI Machine Learning Laboratory where the IRIS data set and other data sets like it are stored, or ImageNet which creates the same thing but just with images. So you can find just about anything, cars, plants, people, watches, phones, just about anything. And it puts it in such a way that it's very easy for people like us to download them and create these massive thousands and thousands of images, data sets, to help train these algorithms. And so that's all good. That's obviously the beneficial use of machine learning, but there's also ethical concerns regarding image recognition like this project. And the example that I like to use is the one between Google and the Pentagon's Project Maven. 
For some of you who don't know, Project MAVEN is just drone research technology to identify specific objects of interest for the military, specifically the U.S. military. And so the Google employees that were tasked with making this project started to fear about what it, the, end, the ultimate uses of this technology were going to be. And so they, didn't, they started getting upset about that, and so they wrote a petition. It got about 3,000 people, and they gave it to the higher-ups saying, we don't want to be a part of this because we don't want ultimately to have blood on our hands. We like to go by Google's old slogan, which was don't be evil, and we believe this technology will ultimately be used for evil. And so the reason I bring this up is because it has a sociocultural effect on data analysis and data collection. Because when people hear this, and also stories like recently with Facebook, people are, when they hear Facebook, are probably gonna have a negative connotation based on the stories coming out about all the data collection. So it damages the credibility and the public perception about this type of technological research. So now back to the positives of this kind of thing. You can see the one that I like to use, and obviously because it's related to this project, is the technology developing around autonomous navigation with real cars, with Tesla, Uber, and Waymo, which Waymo is just Google's uh, self-driving car. And so these, these industry giants have already said that they believe that self-driving cars are gonna be on the market within five to 10 years. That might be optimistic after what happened in Arizona recently, but they're already back up and running as Waymo actually recently put in a permit to have a self-driving test in California, I think in the last couple of days. And also Alphabet, Google's company, uh, parent company, just recently, actually before 2015, so when self-driving was just kind of just starting to pick up steam, had already invested $1.1 billion into this company. So based on these trends, that's why we decided we wanted to use image recognition research and self-driving cars. So then what did we do? We decided that we wanted to use a Raspberry Pi and GoPi Go kit and create two dif different image classifiers, one to recognize the right arrow, one to recognize the left arrow. They would run together and hopefully be able to identify and differentiate the two of them and drive properly. However, we realized after some development that this probably wasn't gonna work out and I'll explain why that is. So the technique we used were hard cascade classifiers and hard cascade classifiers don't take the entire image, they just take hotspots or certain images that they think they can cheat it to get it and to save computing power. So they just use certain regions. So what they do is they compare the certain pixel intensities of these specific regions. And as you can see, it's really good on faces because the face and the eyes is a little bit darker than the space below it. So they create the region right here that they compare it to. So as you can see, they're a little bit darker. So when they calculate the, and compare the pixel intensities, they find that there's probably a set of eyes here, and so they're gonna say that's a face. And it's the same thing over here with a little bit of different region. The bridge of the nose is a little bit lighter than the eyes are. So it puts the region there, and then it says that's probably a face. But as you can imagine, with our cars, with two different classifiers running, they're both gonna read one specific image. They're gonna see that these calculations are the exact same, and they're both gonna say this is my specific arrow, which is not gonna work for navigation. So we had to go back and figure out what we could do instead. So we decided what better image to do than our logo. It has a little bit more uh, colors, a little bit more going on, so it could have a better way of picking up the specific image that we're looking for. And what we believe happened was it put a region right below here to get the lettering, but again, we can't pick these regions, so we don't really know. So what we do, the first step of our project was to get the Pi itself and to build it. We got these off of Dexter Laboratories, they're about $200, they come with a kit. They come with, the kit comes with all the stuff you see here except for the Pi motherboard. Uh, well, the motherboard comes, but it's just not the kit itself. And also the camera. The camera's the camera right here, I just didn't have a picture of it when I took this, I just didn't have it attached. But, so that's what we did. So after we had the car running, we had to update all of our software. Obviously, these packages are sitting in the warehouse for a while. They get old, need to update them. That's just responsible computing. So we used the simple commands to update all the software on them. Then we needed to get OpenCV onto the car. OpenCV is just computer vision. It allows the computer to see pictures and analyze the certain pictures. So we created the directory on the Pi, and then we cloned the OpenCV repository from their GitHub account just using this command right here, and then installed the additional packages, uh, such as NumPy, which is just numeric Python for calculations, and then image format libraries, so it could understand different types of images, JPEG, PNG, TIFF, so on. So now that we had the Pi working and running, 
we needed to have a development environment to start developing our Cascade classifier. Unfortunately, that process is extremely difficult on Windows, so we had to go out of our way to get a virtual machine running Linux so that we could do this development. And we use DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is just a service that allows you to have a virtual machine with just about any interface you want. Uh, these are the specs of it. These aren't really important just for the demonstration, but I just have them up there. And this is what it looks like. It's just a command line, so it's not as nice as your typical Windows computer, but it just takes some time to get used to. And once again, we needed to install OpenCV. We just followed the same process as we did on the previous slide. So now that that had OpenCV as well, we needed to start developing the classifier. And this usually takes about four or five steps. The first step is to build the negative or background images. And these images are just about anything that don't involve the image you're trying to recognize. Then we needed to create the description file, which is basically just plain text files that show where the paths are to each of these negative images. Then using those two, we created the positive images. As you know, we only had the one JME image, so we needed to create thousands of them in order to train them. Uh, then we used the, uh, we created a positive vector file, which just, again, for the sake of demonstration, is just kind of to stitch it all together. And then using all of those files, we finally trained it using OpenCV. So I'm gonna go a little more detail on how we did this specifically. So like I said at the beginning, we used ImageNet to find images of just cars, plants, insects, and buildings. This, again, could be anything, but we just decided that just because those were more the more robust and the best ages, uh, image sets that I found, so that's the ones I chose. Uh, and as you can see, I don't know if you can read this in the back, but we got up to about 4,300 images here. Usually these would be tens of thousands in industry, but just for simplicity's sake, we try to keep it a little smaller. And so we just write a put, wrote a Python script to do that. It would go to the web page, find those images, download them, grayscale them, and resize them to 100 by 100, and put them all into that one folder. Next thing we did was create a, a script to make the negative description file, because we didn't want to go through and write all 4,000 of these, because that would take forever. So instead, we wrote a script to do that, and it would put all the paths in just a simple text document. Now that we had those two files, we could use a command in OpenCV called create samples to superimpose our JMU image onto some of the negatives. So now we had 4,000 negative images and also 3,000 positive images. This just made it so the classifier had more information to work with. So as you can see, just 3,000 numbers, and then this stuff is just part of uh, the other files and just specifications, like how you wanted the image on there to be rotated so it would be look a little different. So now we had the positive vector file. This is just the same thing as the negative one, except with the addition of how many pictures of interest we wanted, just one in all of these, and then where exactly within the image that was. So now it can tell the, the classifier where the image specifically we want to identify is and to look for that in the future. And as you can see, actually I'll say that in the next one. So now, now that we had all of those files created, we can now finally train the classifier. So we used, again, another OpenC command called uh, train cascade, and we added all of the files that we had just created. And the number of positives, we only used 2,800 this time, even though we had 3,000. And we used 4,000, even though we had about 43,000. And that's just because at each stage that it trains, it uses a little bit more images, so we had a little bit more room to wiggle with. And as you can see, again, I don't know if you can see it in the back, but yeah, you probably can't. But this took about seven hours and 15 minutes to do. So between tweaking all of these classifiers, it takes a very long time to train. So it was very frustrating to train them, test them, and then have them not work. So now we have to go back and forth and do it all over again. But these files usually ended up, only ended up being about 20 kilobytes, which is actually tiny. And it created one for each stage. So ultimately, if you wanted to go back and retrain it for more, you could. But ultimately, whenever we tried that, it would just say it was done, and it wouldn't go any further. So now this is what, after we had all of that done, all we had the classifier done, we had to go back and write the code to get the card run. So this is just a flow chart of how the algorithm worked, and you can see it in a second, but I just want to explain it so you know exactly what you're looking for. So first, it loads a classifier, then it asks how many signs there are. It can take as many as you want, but for now we're just going to use one. And it drives towards a sign, it stops, takes a picture, saves that, uploads that into the classifier, analyzes it, if it finds it, it'll flash according to which side it was supposed to be. Originally, that would have worked with the arrows, but we only have one classifier, one option, so it doesn't work now. But it'll just flash the left one because it's only turning left in this case. It turns the car, and then it proceeds to the next one. 
So now I'm going to show. So to do this, we use SSH, which just basically is remote access into the car. So I have access to the car on here. So we run that. Oh, you can't see it over here. Let's see. I'm not sure. Oh, well. All right. So you'll just have to see it as it runs here. But either way, we input the number of signs. It does a simple countdown. Drive. Recognize the image. So we only have one thing right now just because we have a little bit less space. But now that that worked, I'm going to try and show how the classifier works. I don't know if it's going to work because it just messed up on here. Um, let me try it. Is it video? Yeah. I think it created two different things. Let me see if it'll work. I don't know if this is going to work. Yeah, it's only working on my screen, unfortunately. However, I can try and rotate this. It might not work. But, yeah, that's about as far. Would you mind holding this up? So it might not actually work just for your sake, <coughs> but when you do hold this image up, it'll actually recognize it. And I, obviously you guys can't see because the picture's in the way. Um, but if you put it, if you move it, it'll recognize it just because of how, when we trained it, we had it to rotate the image left, right, and backwards. So as you can see, I don't know, some of you guys probably can see it. Yeah. So it recognizes it. But the problem that you can see in here is it's also recognizing all the stuff below it. And so that's also a problem with the process that we did because those are called false positives. And again, if we were to have this car running dynamically, it would pick up on all of those false positives and say these are arrows when they're actually not. So the car would do just about nothing. And it would be good for just about nothing. I'm sorry, I can't have it up here. I don't know why I did this. the PowerPoint will pull up. Oh, that'll work. Let me try the other thing again, actually. I have a little bit of time. Yeah, it's a little you guys can see. On the white background, it's really nice because it only picks up this false positive right here. But as you can see, if you put this in front of it, it recognizes the image. So as you can see, you can move around. There we go. Yeah, so it'll follow it around. As you can see, it's definitely a little rough around the edges, but it definitely works. And so that's the image that it follows, and that's the one that it picks up when you drive the car. But like I was saying with the false positives, if I stand in front of it, it says all of these are Jamie logos when they're really not. And that's the problem with what we do. So now we close out of this. And you can see here, it actually counts the amount that it finds. And it's actually still finding them even though they're not there. <laughs> right. Again. And so what would I recommend, so that is my project as it is, but what would I recommend for future people that were going to pick up this project and continue in the future? Well obviously the first thing to do would be to adjust the classifier, because as you can see it was kind of rough around the edges and it would pick up on a lot of false positives, so refining the algorithm, redoing that, that painstaking process of recreating those files and recreating the classifier would be the first thing that I would recommend. And unfortunately, you can't get rid of all those false positives, even the open CV ones that they have professionally put out to recognize faces or upper bodies or eyes still have false positives. So it's just kind of a problem more with the technique because of how small the images that we used to train with were. 
So the next thing to do, if it wasn't going to be able to get enough false positives to make us satisfied, would be to use a different classifier. And Martin, who did our project before, used a support vector machine to take up the whole image and take the pixel intensities of the whole image and, take it and uh, analyze based on that. Unfortunately, we wanted to do something a little different. Maybe this would work a little better. It did, but obviously, if we couldn't get it to be refined in the future, maybe just going back to that and refining that would be something that you could possibly do. And the next one would be to refine the navigational algorithm. It's a little, it's a little basic right now just because the main point of the project was through the machine learning and not necessarily the driving. So the thing to do would to make it be a little more dynamic, and that goes with the next point, which is using ultrasonic sensors so it's not just hard-coded to drive a certain distance and turn a certain way. Uh, and the next thing to do would be to create a front-end interface so you don't have to remember the commands to make it run. Instead, you can just have a web page and hit a button to make it run that way. And the last thing I would say would be to utilize new software. Google's TensorFlow, which the Google Project Maven was using, would be the top-of-the-line industry standard for the type of thing that we're doing. Originally, we wanted to create these classifiers, have them work. In a perfect world, they would have both worked, and we would have been able to translate that onto TensorFlow and use it that way. Unfortunately, we didn't have the time to do that because of how long the classifiers and how much, how much changing we had to do with the project, so we just had to continue with what we had. So again, I would say use TensorFlow. And so the one thing I would like to end on is this one thing. Why, why study machine learning at all? Why do this at all? And the ex first example I like to use is with medicine because I think that's the most relatable thing that we all have. And so this slide, you obviously cannot see this, but this slide says doctors in 2020 will be shown data 200 times more than the human mind can actually remember. So if you were to pair that with algorithms like this that could analyze all that data, it would actually be a great assistant to have when it comes to diagnosing illnesses before they happen. And so the next one I would like to use is something that is coming out it might already be out now. And it uses the real-time translation of signs using TensorFlow. This is a Google product, it's called Google World Lens. And you can use your video camera and you just video anything or any sign specific. Uh, in the case that you're in a foreign country and you don't know the language, you can show it the sign and it would translate it to your language. We unfortunately might need this a little more than we expected just based on the language barrier. But, so I'd like to end this with saying why I study machine learning. If there's one concept that I learned here in my time here, that's going to thanklessly change the way that we interact with the internet and other companies trying to sell us products, it's going to be machine learning. So. Are there any questions? Yeah. How, how many layers do you have with you? Um, we didn't use any layers specifically in this case. It's not like, it doesn't work necessarily like a neural net does. It just works in the sense that you give it negatives, positives, and you stitch it together, and it compares the two images. So I can appreciate the challenges associated with what you worked on, and I admire your tenacity in creating all of this training data yourself, mm -hmm. like you said, several hours every time. But do you have any thoughts in terms of utilizing open APIs for things like Google image recognition, et cetera? I think absolutely. I think the one that we use ImageNet was just easy because of the way that it formatted all the files. It would just create a web page with just a list of all the URLs to each of the images. So that made it easy for us to write the script to download each of them. But unfortunately, it doesn't have like a lot of images. It has like, like maybe 30, 40,000. Right. But obviously, Google Images has much more images than that. So ultimately, I think that's something that we could also add. But just for the sake of simplicity, that's why we use ImageNet, because it was just a good place to start. But in the future, when we use TensorFlow and embed it on the machine, we're going to use one of the open API uh, that uh, Google has uh, with TensorFlow. Uh, and then we have you know, hundreds of thousands of images. We're doing that in the and, field. That's why and, I asked. Yeah. And we're also going to uh, you know, transition to uh, you know, a neural net and hopefully uh, some deep, deep learning algorithm. So the idea was to get it to embed on the Raspberry Pi, and with TensorFlow Lite, we can embed it now on the Raspberry Pi, and we're doing another project where we embed it you know, on our Android machine uh, to do some other kind of uh, image recognition that has to do with diseases uh, and classifying them. So uh, hopefully uh, a year from now, we'll have a, have a, a change recommendations implemented. Cool. Yeah, and so like I said, usually in industry, these, these classifiers use tens of thousands of images. 
Whereas in our case, we just used a couple thousand just for the sake of getting it to the point where it would actually be, we could work with it and um, have it so it wouldn't take forever because I used one of them with more images and it didn't even get past step one of stage one within two hours. So it just takes a very, very long time in that case. Yep. Uh, why does your training data have to be 100 by 100? Uh, again, it was the same thing that I just said with just how long it takes because that one also, the images that we used to train were only 30 pixels by 30 pixels and that's tiny. So I tried to use it with 50 by 50 and that was the case that it didn't even get past stage one, part one in two hours. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question about the machine learning that's applied to these autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm. It seems to me with the machine learning that these vehicles are going to obtain more information mm -hmm. and they're going to sort of change how they process it, right? They're going to figure out new ways. So when a, when a vehicle is released from, say, Ford or General Motors, it's going to come out of the factory, and then as it navigates more, it's going to learn and it's going to change, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And I don't know a lot about machine learning, so I apologize. My question is a little bit unusual. So that means that when the car comes off, we kind of know what it's going to do. Yeah. But over years, we really don't know mm. what it's going to do. And if I put my ISAT habits of mind on this, how are we gonna set like minimum performance standards or regulate how these vehicles are on the roadways, right? Because they're gonna carry people. They're gonna be interacting with human drivers mm -hmm. for a while. But if this machine is gonna learn on its own, and in theory, couldn't two vehicles that came off the same assembly line wind up performing differently if they learned it would just depend on how the data that it's receiving and learning from is handled because if that goes back to the manufacturer that would be handled the same way software updates are handled with in the putting the new classifier that is used on the training data that it's used while it's driving and then it would update back to the manufacturer and the manufacturer would update that back into the algorithm that it uses so that's in the sense the way that I think that it would handle it but it's a, again that's a good question with how that's going to be handled and because each car is going to be different because they're going to be understanding different roadways. And a road that's driving in Poland is going to be different than the car that's driving in the United States. Right. And, and I know we run out of time, but if you guys stay tuned, uh, Sean, Sean Pence and uh, Ben Bland, I'm not sure if they're here. Uh, they, they're supposed to be here. Uh, we actually uh, put together an um, uh, algorithm so that one car learns, it goes out, He's going to transfer that knowledge to another car. He's going to go out and learn, and we're going to do a cyclic process where we're, where it, where it's iterative, and they continue to learn uh, and and uh, and hopefully get smarter as they um, as they pass on the information to one another. So, uh, and we hope to implement that with a tentacle life. And I know we have the time, so. Yeah. All right. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you.